insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights and Entertainment. This is episode 90. Disney breaking the rules. Breaking the law, breaking the law. I'm your host, All Joseph right. Whalen, and my thankful and social co-host, Michelle Whalen. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Do you know where I came up with the terms this week? Yes. And where did I come up with them? The social interaction we had with our family this past Thanksgiving. Yes. We uh, obviously are, like everyone else, uh, under quarantine to a certain extent. We uh, normally go away for Thanksgiving dinner. Mm -hmm. uh, we Locally, we don't usually, right, right. we don't fly or, you know. What's that, an hour, 15 minutes yeah, or something like that? an hour and 15, hour and a half. Uh, so we'll drive up to uh, a friend's mom's house, mm -hmm. uh, our adoptive parents, I think we can safely say. Yeah, at this point, yeah. Um, and uh, it's usually kind of a roll of the dice as to who shows up for dinner each year, which is always fun. Right, right. Uh, and we all pack into her house there where there's tons of food, tons of games, and much fun to be had. Mm -hmm. uh, and we couldn't do that this year. Yeah. You know, this year we were all stuck at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think we kind of did a good job of making the most of it. Yeah, we we started a Zoom at, what, 9.30 in the morning. About that, yeah. So that we could watch the Macy's Thanksgiving Parade, which was obviously a little different. Slightly abbreviated. This year. Um, and then the family favorite right afterwards is the dog show. Yep. And what was funny was we were streaming through... Um, through Zoom, the dog show. So I actually was the one that was projecting through my laptop the dog show so that we could all watch it. I'm sure we watch broke it tons we of probably. SEC rules on that one. <laughs> so we, we all watched the dog show together, and then um, everybody kind of ate a, at different times because we also had different time zones. Right. Um, so my yeah, one... Yeah, so we had <clears throat> two, fa two, two New Jersey... Two, uh, maybe three, because I think Allison's in New Jersey okay. also. So a couple of people stayed on for the majority of the time, and then there were various family and friends that would log on for just a couple of hours, and then, you know, So it was very off. much like how we normally would do, where right. people, you have a core group that shows up that for shows the majority from, of the day. Right. And then you have wayward spirits that, that sort of wander come maybe in and just go. For you know, dessert right, or something. Because right. so a lot of people have other familiar commitments right, outside. Right. So I think in total there were 17 people. Wow. All together at, you know, from, you know. Um, so yeah, so like Barb, she was actually the first to, to eat. She kind of ate lunch. Uh, so she, you know, ate. And then we got to watch everybody else prepare. Right. Um, we actually logged off to eat just so that I could give my laptop a chance to, to, to charge. Um, and then we logged back on and, you know, some yeah, extra people. Yeah, because we started out in the morning on my right, iPad. Right. Then when you had to do the streaming of the dog, dog show, show, I switched, you switched to my switched laptop. To your Surface Pro. Right. So then we had that going, and then I took it into the kitchen while I and since we did uh, we didn't do a whole turkey, we did turkey parts. We only needed an hour to cook where, you know, obviously if you're cooking something bigger, you need, you know, more time. So it was funny to see everybody's prep time and, you know, what everybody else was making and stuff. Um, and then after we had dinner, we logged back on and then it was 
our game time. Because that we... was probably the most creative way of playing <laughs> games through Zoom I think I've ever seen. Well, and and what was funny was I w- I was in charge of trying to find a game to play. So I had looked online, done a little research, and there's all these different websites that have oh games to play through Zoom or whatever. But all of them, you know, for for a good portion of them, you had to buy the actual game, like a hard copy of, of the game. And it was like, well, I can't do that. <laughs> I need to play this in a couple of hours. And there were a couple of online versions, but they were kind of wonky. Um, the one, uh, there was one where it was a, an app for your phone. And basically, as long as one person was the host, you could send codes out to other people. So that was the one. I was thinking was that the of Jackbox. It wasn't Jackbox. It's actually um, from the same makers that do Heads Up. Oh, okay, okay. And it's kind of. I think it was called Psych, and it was they would give you a question, and you had to make up the answer. Okay. And you'd have to guess who did that one. So I thought that would kind of be cool because that's kind. You know, we usually do those types of guess who said what games. You know, right, with our group. Right. But then I was like, well, what about Scategories? And we were like, yeah, because we've all played Scategories, you know, before as a, as a big family group. So what we did, <laughs> this, this was very creative. Um, so I set up my phone in a little holder. Then I took a photo holder and put the car, the list of all the categories so, hanging so from that. So if you that. played Scategories. The categories board game before there right. are cards with various lists. So you roll a die that has letters on there. You get right. the letter that you, the words have to start with, and then the list has a description of what you have to make a list of ten words with right. that letter R. Right. So you had the cards right. in a photo holder being streamed from your phone that mm-hmm. was logged into Zoom. Right. While, while we, we were, were logged in on the laptop right. on Zoom playing with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So it was. It was pretty cool and it worked out you know and and we we had you know somebody was in charge of the timer and you know once the timer went off you know i I have to say (laughs) because of the number of people we usually Mm -hmm. have involved and the personalities of the people we have involved it's usually organized chaos Mm -hmm. in most cases Mm -hmm. and i think this year, game time was probably the most organized event that we had <laughs> ever right. with, with this group of people. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was really fun. Yeah. So we had, you know, the one group had, what, there was one, two, three, four. They had six people at their house. Then there was, you know, one, 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 and us. And the the two right. of us, so it, you know, it was interesting. And then again, the different time zones. So you know, so we had a, a good portion in uh, New Jersey. The majority were in Pennsylvania, right. and then one was New Mexico. So I don't think she ended up eating until we probably logged off because I think we yeah, were she's done. What three hours? Yeah. So different? it was like eight yeah. o'clock when we logged off, and they were basically just getting pizza. Yeah. <laughs> That yeah. night. So it was. It worked out. You it know. worked out. It would have been wonderful if we could have all been together Absolutely. for the holiday. Absolutely. Uh, but given the considerations that we had, the restrictions that we had, the, the desire to make sure nobody got sick in the process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think it worked out better than I thought it was going to. Mm-hmm. So I was very impressed. Yeah, and and you know, a couple of people made comments. You know, like it, it was with. The time of, of year it is and, and the, the, the times that we're living in, at least we were all connected and we felt more connected, you know, than we we thought we would. Sure. And yeah. that, you know, we didn't, you know, some, you know, basically said I didn't feel as alone as I thought I, I was going to, knowing that I wasn't going to be able to physically yeah, be you there, figure we're so. all, what eight months, nine months yeah. into this pandemic now, mm-hmm. with people isolated in their homes, people mm-hmm. working from home, not even getting out of the house. Yeah, yeah. You know, if if technology can give us that ability mm-hmm. to capture what is really a very intimate experience mm-hmm. on Thanksgiving right. every year, yeah, when we can even capture a facsimile of that, we're we're doing pretty good, mm-hmm. and, I, and I think we did pretty good this year. Yeah, yeah, we did. So that was a quick recap of the holiday. Um, you know, in the process of that, we had we rearranged two rooms here. We 
moved one 65 inch TV upstairs, set up new furniture, cleaned the whole area, broke a bunch of stuff down. Then today the new TV came in for downstairs. We got that all set up. So right. it's been a busy couple of days. Yeah, we're tired. <laughs> yeah. So so if we doze off during the show, we do apologize in yeah, advance. Yeah, it's it's not you guys. It's you know, it's us. <laughs> so anyway, this show, we actually do have a show here. Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> We do? I thought we, we were just going to... We, we, no. We de no, this isn't the Zoom call. That ended... Oh, that ended, yeah. That like was two days five ago. Five minutes ago or right, something like right. that. It seemed like it. <laughs> uh, so in today's episode, uh, in our Disney Detective, we're going to talk about how Disney's double standard on unofficial use of its intellectual property is coming to light. We'll also talk about the short-lived uh, new McDonald's Disney Happy Meal toys and what happened to them. Mm-hmm. In our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, we'll look at how Mandalorian is breaking the mold for Star Wars storytelling. We will have a short but extremely spoiler-filled section on this week's Mando as well, our Mando moments. Uh, if that works out well, we might do that for the rest of the season, which is only a few more episodes. So right, I was right. kind of late to the game on this one. In our entertainment news... We will talk about a legendary Thanksgiving tradition that gives back this year. Uh, and we'll see a, a side of Stan Lee that most people have never seen or heard before. And then, of course, we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week, of which we're going to have a role reversal to a certain <laughs> extent on this week's picks this week. Uh, but before we get started, I would invite folks to subscribe to the podcast uh, you can get our audio versions listed under Insights into Entertainment. Uh, you can also get our video versions listed under Insights into Things, and that's all the shows on the network. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Amazon, and Pandora. Uh, we would also invite folks to reach out to us and give us your feedback. You can reach us via email at comments at insightsintothings.com. We are on Twitter at insights underscore things. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. We do occasionally put stuff up on Instagram where we are at insights into things. And uh, we also have links to all those social media accounts uh, and all of our shows on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Shall we get started? Sure. All right. It, it annoys me because I did a sound check beforehand and everything was working and now it's it's not going to work. And, and We'll just sing our own songs. Uh, this way I don't have to go back and edit it in post. That works for me. Yeah, whatever. Okay. Um, I don't know if the, if the ads are going to work though, so we'll see. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Let's just give it a try. It's going to be one of those shows. It's one of those shows. Go for Disney Detective. So this kind of popped up, uh, and, and what caught my attention on this was a, various stories that we had talked about, what, almost a, a year ago, maybe? Maybe it was? Uh, definitely months ago. About, you know, the fact that, you know, Disney... Um, you know, is the owner of a very substantial um, amount of intellectual property, uh, you know, so much so that, you know, as we had talked, uh, you know, months ago, there was a family whose son had passed away who was a huge Spider-Man fan and they had wanted to use a Spider-Man logo on his headstone and Disney wouldn't give them permission, you know, to do that. So here's, you know, a case of, you know, maybe a double standard. Um, so for those of you that aren't familiar with challenge coins, uh, what, they started mostly in the military? Mostly in the military. Um, you know, the idea is, is that they're, you know, a small coin and it's, you know, kind of a commemorative medallion that's usually distributed within a, a an organization as a symbol of membership um, and, you know, kind of fosters some sort of challenges in, in which people are supposed to, you know, if somebody ha says, hey, do you have your you know, your coin on you, you're supposed to produce it. And if you don't, there's some sort of 
punishment. Usually, um, it, usually it involves uh, alcoholic beverages. And right. if someone challenges you to produce the coin that you are supposed to carry with you all the time and you don't have it. Right. You have to buy everyone who has their coin a round of drinks. Right. So, you know, I'm sure there's different rules for different groups, but that's kind of the gist of, of how most of them, you know, had started. But it seems that uh, Disney Security actually has a bunch of these challenge coins that Disney doesn't print them they're not you know printed by disney obviously somebody within the group of you know security had ordered these and you know passed them out um and you know when it was kind of asked you know why disney doesn't um uh uh crack down on it it was well you know their their kind of response to it was Oh, you're going to bring up yours? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the response to it was, well, most of our security are, um, you know, ex-military or uh, ex-police officers. And it's kind of a tradition, you know, with the, you know, with the military and with the police officers. So, you know, if they want to kind of use it as their camaraderie, we're, you know, we don't want to stop them. But again, then you have the people that wanted to use their likeness for other things and and they wouldn't allow it. So again, kind of the double standard. But the other thing too is that in this article it talked about that you could actually look on eBay and you could find certain ones. Now it might not be uh, the specific ones that security uses because in the article it even says the ones that they show in their article aren't all of them that there's you know more that are out there that are kind of more private ones so yeah so the ones that are up on the screen now these are actually ones that i had designed and had made up for our gaming guild mm -hmm. in our star wars the old republic game and it's really just a uh, the purpose of them is really to denote membership and, mm -hmm. and show appreciation for, for people. And, you know, we kind of went along the lines of, of what the uh, military traditions were with it, with the whole drinking and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Because we would occasionally get together for uh, guild meet and greets right. around the country. Um, but the difference here is that the intellectual property that's on these coins are from my own personal designs. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not using someone else's. I'm not using a Star Wars logo. I'm not doing anything right. from a from a strictly Star Wars standpoint on these. These are reminiscent of uh, symbolism that's in Star Wars, but none of the stuff is copywritten from right. from Star Wars. And and I think kind of the 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 issue that I have with this whole thing is probably the hypocrisy. Where, you know, you, you brought up the example of, of the young boy who had passed away and the parents, he was a big Spider-Man fan, and the parents mm -hmm. wanted to have Spider-Man on his tombstone. And Disney wouldn't do it because it they didn't have control of the intellectual property. Right. But you have a situation here where, all right, so they're Disney employees. Right. But these aren't Disney-sanctioned coins. Mm -hmm. So how is that okay, but honoring this this young boy who passed away is not okay it 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 smacks of hypocrisy mm -hmm. um just as much as the one article we didn't include this week in disney detective was about the new announcement on layoffs mm -hmm. you know disney's announcing thirty two thousand layoffs at the park none of which are executives and and to me that's hypocrisy because your executives, yes, I understand because the park attendance is down, because the, some of the, a lot of the parks are closed, you don't have work for people. So there's a certain collateral damage associated with that. The problem that I have is that there are ways that you can keep the business going. And it is the sole responsibility of the executives the executive management team at Disney to keep the business going and to make money. And 
if you're telling me that they've completely abdicated that responsibility and they're just going to lay off all these people, then they're not doing their jobs. Mm. And yet they're still con continuing to, to draw right. their salary. Mm -hmm. so And their full salary in most cases. Exactly. And they, they had it reduced and now they, <clears throat> they brought it back up mm -hmm. in the midst of laying off tens of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a level of hypocrisy that seems to be rampant throughout Disney at this point in time where certain, you know, everyone's created equal, but there are those who are more equal than others. Mm -hmm. and, and people aren't all being treated fairly in this deal here. Uh, so that's sort of the parallel that I wanted to draw on that. Sure. Uh, but besides that issue, uh, McDonald's is having some issue with, with Disney stuff now, too. Whoopsie. So uh, last week we talked about the new McDonald's Happy Meal toys that McDonald's w was offering to celebrate uh, Disney's anniversary. And, um, well seems there were some problems uh so you know as soon as it kind of started i think within a week uh mcdonald's has temporarily stopped giving out the disney world line of happy meal toys so the article actually came from insider.com and they mentioned that wdw news uh had reported had originally reported this and they had actually gotten some internal mcdonald's restaurant brief alert saying that the toys included faulty qr codes that led to error messages and also unintended search results uh, when you use when you scanned it outside of the McDonald's app, um, so uh, now supposedly the toys were going to be returning uh, to locations this week, but some customers had said on Twitter that they still, uh, when going to McDonald's locations to try and find it. They uh, weren't getting the McDon the the Disney Happy Meal toy. They were just basically getting a generic version. And in the one memo uh, that they had obtained, it basically said, you know, stop do you know stop giving out the the Disney one. Stop using the Disney Happy Meal boxes. Give the generic whatever generic toys you have, you know, available. Um, so, <laughs> so supposedly they were going to, you know, they had to ship all the toys back. They were going to do something where they were going to take out the paper um, or redo it or something because some of the codes were giving you error messages and some of them were actually sending you to adult sites. So, yeah, I could see why parents wouldn't it, want their this is you know. <laughs> this is interesting because for those who aren't familiar with qr codes a qr code is really just a graphical representation of text just like a barcode is mm -hmm. and the qr code itself you would you would basically take a url for a mm -hmm. website you'd plug it into a qr code generator and it generates a little what are called three-dimensional barcodes mm -hmm. um the the interesting thing is here those URLs or those web addresses had to have been established already before printing. Right. So one of two things had to have happened. Hmm. Either A, someone put the wrong web addresses in. Right. Or B, someone hijacked the web addresses that were there that are being put out. Now, one of those would require an inside job. Mm -hmm. Because if someone registered these URLs for the purpose of this project they would have had foreknowledge as to what those URLs were. Right. Could then go out and alter those URLs at that point in time. So I'd be curious to see how this actually ends and where this investigation goes. Mm, Was yeah. this a case of deliberate malfeasance on the part of the company that printed these out and, and produced these toys? Where they had somebody on the inside who... Who, tweaked it and yeah yeah who deliberately modified those urls yeah or was this a an outside attack after the fact where someone may have gotten an advanced copy of these and then gone out and hacked the site that they were pointing to right um so kind of interesting that mm -hmm. that you're getting different results too right right which was which was interesting 
Um, and, you know, I guess it's kind of a good thing that they caught this early on. Right. Um, it's hard to believe that this type of thing could have gone through their quality assurance mm -hmm. engineers. Right. And, and nothing was wrong with the actual toy itself. There right. wasn't any recall on the toy. It was basically the packaging in the toy. So I'm surprised they didn't just tell each location, hey, just, you know, throw the toy in, take it out of the bag. Right. And, like... and Disney generally is very controlled mm -hmm. on its licensing. Right. So they don't just say, okay, you can go print stuff with our with our logos and stuff like that on it. Right. They're involved in that process mm -hmm. throughout the entire process. So it makes me think that the URLs were probably legitimate at first and then were probably attacked at some point mm. in time once these things went out there. So there's probably a breakdown security. I don't know. Unfortunately, we didn't see what the URLs were. So we don't know right. who was hosting these. Yeah, because there was no place that right. posted anything. It was just right. so various we, articles about it. There's no way for us to know <laughs> who was responsible for the security of those sites. Right. And it, chances are that's probably where the breakdown occurred. And we've seen this numerous times mm -hmm. in the past where a website's been advertised out there. It gets hacked, and then they put something inappropriate up there to try to right. damage someone's brand. Um, but... They did say this was temporary, so we can expect to see these toys come back out. They haven't given a time frame though on that, have right. they? Right. They were, you know, they were saying within the week, um, you know. So I guess it it really depends on your location, where you are. I wonder how the sales are going on eBay. If that yeah. now bumps the price up, um, make, might make them ultra rare now. All of a sudden, <laughs> exactly. you never know. So I know so. I never got a you know a set and never looked. You know, to even see what they were uh, were going for. So, yeah. if you have them, good for you. <laughs> Hold on to them because they're probably going to be worth a lot of money. Yep. So, I think that was all we had for mm -hmm. our Disney detective. Yep. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and probably have a very quiet commercial that I have to fix and post. Uh, and then we'll come back with our tales from the edge of the galaxy. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. So this article came from Inverse.com, and it basically talks about how the Mandalorian is doing, uh, you know, a storytelling trick that Star Wars movies could actually never really do. So it talks about how when, you know, a new Star Wars movie comes out, Everybody, you know, flocks to it. But the movie, for the most part, is pretty predictable. There's going to be a Jedi. There's going to be fight with a Sith. There's going to be multiple planets, some sort of galactic warfare, a final lightsaber battle. Nothing wrong with it. That just tends to be the, the formula of a, a Star Wars movie. Um, but sometimes, you know, as we've talked about, it kind of gets a little tiring it's the same thing over and over again um but obviously when the mandalorian premiered um instead of using star wars you know th that same recipe they kind of 
thought outside of the box and and did their storytelling a little bit differently. Um, So while Star Wars is kind of seen as a space opera, The Mandalorian is really a space western, which, you know, we've kind of talked about since, you know, the first season and really more so when you see, you know, the, the second season. So, again, instead of telling an epic story of good versus evil our you know our hero you know mando kind of finds himself you know constantly filling in those uh the role of the mysterious uh masked stranger who rolls into town and helps out you know with his trusty sidekick you know and he's basically the lone ranger you know in space which is kind of funny because it really is kind of the the role that he plays um and with that you are able you know each episode also takes on a different uh a different mood um as well so when this article came out there were just um the three episodes had had premiered in it and it basically talks about how um, you know, each episode is done in a, a different style. So you had uh, the season two premiere, which was the Marshall, and that was just downright space western. You had um, the uh, uh, the Tuscan Raiders, who were kind of the Native Americans, and you had you know the townspeople who were very against them, but realized everybody had to work together to fight you know, the monster, uh, and bring the town kind of closer together and, and, and save them. Uh, you even kind of had the saloon scene and, and, and whatnot. Um, and then in episode two, it, it shifted gears. Uh, episode two was the passenger and it was Mando basically, uh, playing the, the taxi driver and it was very reminiscent of the fifth element where he, you know, is helping this woman get, you know, to her husband and protect her, uh, uh, her, her unborn children. And then you have this whole space encounter with these icy, uh, spiders again, totally different look from, from the first one. Uh, and then the third, uh, episode was the heiress where now Mando and baby Yoda, have delivered the frog lady to the water planet. And when you think of water, you think of pirates and it was a very pirate themed episode. So it's amazing how within one season you have all these kind of genres thrown together. And then even this last episode, which we'll talk about in in our next little segment, again, a totally different feel for it as well. And I think that's what, makes it you uh, you know for fans of star wars for fans you know of just sci-fi in general such an appealing show because it's so different it's not really the same thing week after week so and this is a theme that they had had picked up in the first season Mm -hmm. too where from episode to episode you had the overarching story right that they Sometimes would develop, sometimes they wouldn't. Sometimes you would do character development to introduce people that would move the story forward. Mm -hmm. But every episode that you saw was different. Mm -hmm. And I think the brilliance of the show so far is the fact that they have this extremely talented team of directors that all have their own idea of how they want to tell the story. Yes, And, And in addition to that, you have showrunners like Mm -hmm. John Favreau and Dave Filoni Mm -hmm. who give the directors that freedom. And the result that you get are unique standalone episodes with different styles, different genres, different backgrounds, different settings. Um, But they all move the story forward and they do it in a way that keeps you guessing from week to week. Mm -hmm. Um, He is the Lone Ranger. There's elements of the Lone Ranger. There's elements of Wagon Train. Mm -hmm. There's elements of um, the Rifleman. There's even elements of the A-Team in here as, you know, he gets hired and and goes out and and takes on these different jobs that the good guys take. Yeah. And given the history of Mandalorians and Star Wars, 
that's a very different depiction of what Mandalorians are, are shown as. Mandalorians are a warring tribe. Mandalorians are the equivalent in Star Wars of what the Spartans were in ancient history. They were born, bred, and raised to be warriors. Their entire culture centered around war. Um, their entire heritage, you know, they would, they would, their best guard, you know, their, that was, that was their, their religion was war, mm-hmm. basically. Um, and Dave Filoni kind of started to, to chip away at that image in the Clone Wars with what he was doing with the Mandalorians in the mm-hmm. Clone Wars. And this is obviously a, a continuance mm-hmm. of that effort here. Um, so it's what makes each week interesting is, like everyone wants to know what's going to happen to baby Yoda, but that's it's icing. It's on the cake, you know, it's, right. it's, it's a gravy. Mm-hmm. What you tune in for is to see where's he going this week? Right. What, what Western are we going to see come right. out this week? Right. You know, like we had a classic showdown at noon, mm-hmm. you know, high noon right. showdown in this week's episode. It and was, this one was almost more like samurai. Yes. This was had a very, you know, Asian. Yes overtone to it so i i kept thinking of like samurai movies absolutely even know, the, even the, like the setting where the mm-hmm. the final battle right. happened with uh the as yet to be named individual that we right. don't want to spoil just yet right um uh, it was like a, a pagoda mm-hmm. that they were fighting in yeah um so the imagery it 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 brings a certain level of familiarity mm-hmm. and that familiarity grounds the viewer so that somebody who isn't a Star Wars fan can still watch the show mm-hmm. and get entertainment value out right. of it. It's not one of these things where you have to read all the books and watch all the movies right. and, and play all the games. Which is kind of the direction that Disney has gone since they took over the, the franchise with the movies. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we I criticize the, the sequel trilogies a lot and... and quite deservedly so but one of the biggest criticisms i've had about the the sequel trilogies is there's a lot of background information that doesn't come out in the movies now i know you can only put so much in a movie i get that right the problem i have is that the information that they're trying to feed off of is information that are informs that the average viewer is not going to consume you know, the the average person that wants to go see Star Wars is not going to go read, you know, five novels to, to right, figure to out who up. the First Order is or who this character right. is and stuff like that. Right. And what happens is you you get into the movie theater and you watch it and you there's a lot of story that goes on, mm-hmm. but you miss the majority of it because you don't know who these people are or right. how you got to this point or, or any of that stuff. Right. And The Mandalorian goes the exact opposite way. You know, to the point where you almost overdevelop your characters in this mm-hmm. case here, but you have the freedom to do that in a television show. Mm-hmm. And the one thing they're doing smartly here is they're putting elements into this show that's very popular that feed into the movies. So they're they're drawing the parallels from the original trilogy and the sequel trilogy now with some of the elements that they're putting in here, which is very nice. Um, and they're doing the same thing with some of the previous animated series. The Clone Wars and Rebels are getting elements in the Mandalorian. So they're using Mandalorian as a platform to sort of tie all those things together. So you don't have to go read all the novels, but if you do, it enhances things. Right. But we're going to give you those pieces of information here. We're going to we're going to draw those lines where mm-hmm. they need to be drawn. Right. Because we have the freedom to do it. And, and that doesn't necessarily drive the Mandalorian story forward, but it helps to tie the entire universe together. It's like the Force. It binds the universe together. The Mandalorian binds the universe together. No, it does. Just like duct tape. <laughs> the light side, dark side, etc., etc. Right, right. So anyway, that was that was what we had for... Uh, 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 how the Mandalorian is taking storytelling <laughs> in a different direction. I scrolled up too far. Oh, uh, okay. Scroll down. Scroll down. So, 
spoiler alert here. Everything we're going to talk about for the next few minutes until we get to our entertainment news is spoilers of this week's episode of The Mandalorian, which was what, episode five, five? of season two. Right. Right. So if you have not watched or have yet to watch, but you will be watching and you don't want to know. Pretend like you're one of my videos and just pause. And just pause. And turn the volume off. And right turn now. the volume down. <laughs> we'll, we'll, when you see the transition, you know you can turn the volume back We'll go again. like this and say it's okay to come back. <laughs> red flags. Red, get the red flags. Get your red flags here. <laughs> <laughs> so four main things came out of this episode that I wanted to touch on. Okay. Take it away. Who is Groku? Groku <laughs> is Yoda plus yogurt plus Gogurt. <laughs> gives you Groku. <laughs> now, we find out this week that Groku is the name of the child. Right. I, w I was almost hoping that it was going to be a, a girl. Like, I, I was waiting for her to say, well, she. Right. And he would have been like, what? Yeah. Yeah, that would have been cool. That would have been a cute little, you know, and then she gets to wear a cute little little bow after bow that or something yeah, yeah. Or, but yeah so, so so we find this out when ahsoka tano shows up the mando goes to see her and she through the force communicates telepathically with the child mm -hmm. and we find out that the child is uh, ironically born the same year that anakin skywalker is born we find out that he was trained at the Jedi Temple and right. was secreted away before the purge occurred. Mm -hmm. We don't know who yet. So I think that might be kind of a key to find out who actually takes him, takes him away. Right. Um, but we also find out that he's become so attached to the Mandalorian right. that his fear of being separated has caused Ahsoka Tano pause in her task of training him. Correct. She doesn't want to train him, and she makes references to how, you know, the greatest of Jedis uh, fell to the dark side because of his fear of detachment from the one he loves. Mm -hmm. So there were some some really cool parallels with mm -hmm. that. The next big reveal is Thrawn. So Thrawn, if you read the um, Expanded Universe books, Thrawn is this blue-faced, red-eyed member of the Chiss species uh, who was a Grand Admiral uh, during the Imperial Era, and he goes off uh, on assignment prior to the Return of the Jedi, and uh, he's off doing something in the Unknown Regions, and he winds up coming back after the Empire is defeated, and he rallies the Empire to basically, you know, revive the Empire. Um when they threw all the Expanded Universe stuff out, they threw all that out anyway. However, they did bring him back in Clone Wars. Mm -hmm. It was Clone Wars or Re Rebels. They brought him back in Rebels. And he's still this military genius, blah, blah, blah. And apparently this person who was the magistrate on the planet they, they were on this week uh, served him. Mm -hmm. And Ahsoka Tano is now searching for Thrawn. Right. Uh, she had some interactions with him during uh, Rebels, which is worthwhile to, to take a look at. What this might open up is the return of some other people in live action from mm -hmm. Rebels. Right. So the last we saw of Ezra Bridger, who was one of the key members of the crew uh, in Rebels, was he is basically attacking Thrawn. Or he's holding Thrawn a hostage with this space being, and they jump into hyperspace and you don't hear anything else from them. So if Thrawn survived, chances are he survived, okay. and we might see him. We might also see Sabine Wren, who was the token Mandalorian in the Rebels, right? Um, who also sort of went off and did her own thing. She happened to be one of the people who wielded the Dark Saber. The Dark Saber. Ah, back here. Yeah, that one there. Um, she <laughs> wielded that for a period of time. Okay. And um, 
would be interesting to see how she interacts, considering the dark saber has surfaced again in this show. Right. So a lot of elements together there. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Ahsoka shows up, and that was kind of what we everybody's been. That's what to say. everyone. That was the the worst kept secret of the season, I think, <laughs> is Ahsoka. Right. Um, fantastic job. She mm-hmm. had her her. Uh, dual white lightsabers, mm-hmm. which if you had watched uh, Clone Wars, Rebels, etc., uh, she lost her lightsabers when she left the Jedi Order. She lost her lightsabers, original lightsabers that were given to her from uh, Anakin Skywalker. She had a conflict with a Sith Inquisitor who she confiscated his blades and purify the blades so that they were white. So there, there's some story behind her blades, which was kind of cool. Okay. Um, big question that was left over, is she going to be back on the show again? Right. Uh, given the popularity of the character, uh, given, given the, the awesome uh, premiere that she had, mm-hmm. which I have to say, like the fight scenes that she was involved in. Yeah were very reminiscent of the fight scenes that she had in Clone Wars and Rebels and was done so well. Uh, I th- I think we're going to see her. Whether, I don't think, I think we might not see her in this season. Mm-hmm. But definitely. But we'll definitely future. see her again. She might show up in the mm-hmm. finale, but I, 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 it concerns me that you're having all these named famous people show right. up in, in this show now that was supposed to be held on the fringe. Right. So we'll we'll see how much they use. I don't want to see them overuse these key characters. Mm-hmm. The last thing here was a, a personal favorite of mine, and that was the next leg on his journey to help Roku is he's being sent to Tython. Now, Tython is a central theme world in the Star Wars The Old Republic game. In fact, that's your starting world if you play on the light side. And it is, it's billed as the first Jedi temple. Of course, the one that we see Luke at in Force uh, Awakens is the first Jedi temple. So there's a lot of first Jedi temples out there. I mean, it's like... The first Jedi temple of this location. Right. And the first right. Jedi temple of that location. It's like, you right. know, Joe's famous hamburgers, you know? Why is it famous? Because I said it's famous. Right. Why is okay. this the first Jedi temple? Because so. I said it is. Gotcha. Uh, so... It, they're tying uh, Star Wars The Old Republic in, which had been declared non-canon back when Lucas still mm-hmm. controlled things. So that offers some hope. Right. So now all of a sudden everything that wasn't yes. is now yes. little by little being brought in. Right. And one of those things that I think a lot of people would love to see is the return of Darth Revan, who was a Jedi, then was a Sith, then was a Jedi, then was a Sith, and then went schizophrenic and had split personality and everything Can't imagine else. Why? Um, <laughs> the interesting thing about Revan was Revan was all Old Republic. It, he was originally in Knights of the Old Republic. Then he showed up in Star Wars: The Old Republic, both of which have been considered non-canon now. But they recently released his ultimate Force Effects lightsaber which seems to suggest that there is a market out there for it. Right. That he might be around, he might be coming back, because he, he's one of these ones you can't kill. Right. Because he's been killed like 12 times and he keeps coming back. <laughs> he's like the Jesus of Star Wars. He's the Jesus of Star Wars. Um, Nothing sacrilegious about that at all. May the Force be with you. And also with you. Thank you. There we go. We got that out of our system. <laughs> Um, and the last thing w- with regard to Tython is that he's told to take Groku there, Baby Yoda there, and put mm-hmm. him up on this seeing stone, which is similar to what uh, Luke sat on in uh, Last Jedi. I forget which terrible s- sequel movie it was. <laughs> the one where they killed Luke off uh, needlessly. But it's similar to that where it's the high point of the temple and, and it's a focal point of all that stuff. And he's supposed to reach out into the force, and it's supposed to send out a beacon of some sort. The Groku beacon, we'll call it, to all force users. Now, she depicts this as, oh, it it should reach out to all the Jedi. And the question that, that begs to be asked is, well... Wouldn't it reach out to all force users, light side and dark, and dark side? side? Right. 
<coughs> so what dark side users are out there mm. and what light side users, because we already have um, the the recent game with Calca uh, Calcastus. Calcastus? I forget. what you, you murdered his name last time we talked about him. Uh. He was from the new uh, Star Wars something something game. And they, they released his lightsaber. Okay. They wrote it on his lightsaber. Remember oh, that one? Oh, right, right, right. So he's obviously out there in this time frame, too. Okay. So does he show up? Played by, I forget the actor's name, who played the Joker in uh, Gotham. Uh, help me out here. You watched the show. The I didn't. Joker in Gotham. Oh, oh, I don't even remember his yeah, name. Yeah, that guy. But I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so he might show up in the show at some point in time, too, because, you know, we turned on the lighthouse here, and we're we're telling everyone to come, come, come see Come and us. see Groku. Right. right. So I'm curious where that's going to go. Hmm. So okay. that were the four takeaways that I had from the show, uh, a couple of things that I'm interested in. I don't know if we're going to see these play out on Mandalorian. Mm. Because there's already talk of an Ahsoka television show, live action spinoff that might be happening, mm. that you might see a lot of the Thrawn stuff and, and the other Rebel stuff happen there. So we'll see. But each week it seems like they're dropping blockbuster style mm -hmm. hints here and there. Yeah, yeah. Last week it was the... Uh, the clones and the First Order reference. And the and Death the, Troopers. I want to call them Dark Troopers. I don't think they're Death okay. Troopers. Okay, Dark Troopers. Death okay. Troopers are what uh, okay. Director Krennic had. Okay. They were just Stormtroopers in black armor. Okay, whatever. It's amazing what Stormtroopers that can't shoot anything can do with a, scan, a can of spray paint. <laughs> <laughs> they still can't shoot anything. They still can't shoot anything. Uh, so anyway... <sighs> Uh, assuming the show continues, uh, we might be bringing Mando moments back to do another sure. in-depth uh, analysis of it. Sure. But that was all we had. We're running short on time, so let's move on. We'll be, we're just going to move right into, because I'll hit the button here and we're not going to get any sound. So, okay. Uh, we're just going to move right into entertainment news at this so point. So you can come back now. Okay, we're come good. Back. Yay. We're good. Wait, I'll push the transition. I should do that. Okay. okay, now we're back. So let's talk <coughs> entertainment news. Uh, I feel this show it just it, it's lost such production value this weekend. <laughs> yeah, some days it's good, some days it's not. It's okay. Uh, so let's talk about <coughs> a Thanksgiving classic that's giving back. So well wishers have donated more than a hundred thousand dollars to help Alice Brock the artist and former cook immortalized by for folk singer Arlo Guthrie in his classic Thanksgiving tune, Alice's Restaurant Massacre. Nearly 2,000 people had pitched in over the last two months on a GoFundMe to help the 80-year-old hippie who had been hit by hard times since the 1967 release of Guthrie's 18-minute long talk about uh, uh, talking blues ballad. Um, it's been tremendous. God, what a relief, Brock told uh, the New York Post on Thursday about the outpour of support. Uh, the New York-born woman's home and for former diner in Massachusetts were the setting of Guthrie's song about this, how the singer uh, was arrested in 1965 on Thanksgiving Day for littering, and that actually kept him out of the army during the Vietnam War. Um, you know, as the song goes, you can get anything you want at Alice's Restaurant. Uh, they actually even did a comedy based on the song Alice's Restaurant that came out in 1969, and Brock, who didn't want to play herself on the big screen, on the big screen, actually took a part as an extra in the movie. Um, people used to say, oh, my mother, you know, knows who you are. And now people are saying, oh, my grandmother knows who, who you are, how she's, you know, become this folk icon. Um, so after the flick and the closing of her diner, she opened a larger restaurant uh, in 1976 and continued to give back to the community. 
Uh, she said, there are a few things that I wouldn't give to people. Um, so if somebody asked me for a job, I gave them a job. And especially if they were really in need of a job, like the people that were on parole or people who didn't have rent money. Um, and the unfortunately, the eatery went under in the late 70s. And she ended up moving to another area of Massachusetts uh, where she was working as a prep cook uh, and doing art, you know, during the day. But unfortunately, money ran out and, you know, she was struggling uh, to pay the mortgage. And then she ended up moving in with some people. And then, unfortunately, she had some health issues. And that's really where things kind of went uh, downhill. And then she uh, had spent uh, time in a hospital and then in a nursing home. But now she's finally back in her little cottage. But she needed help with the rent. And that's when a friend of hers, who was a member of a 70s and 80s uh, new wave band, had kind of stepped in and created this online fundraiser and had actually raised over $100,000, um, you know, as of last Thursday. Um, she had said, with the money that was raised, I'll be able to live decently for the next, you know, two or three years. Um, she said that she was, you know, kind of reluctant and, and embarrassed by it because she didn't want to ask people, but she felt very humbled that there were so many fans out there who knew who she was and that wanted, you know, to give back. Well, that's nice. That's mm -hmm. a, it's a nice Thanksgiving story. And we all know that Thanksgiving is not Thanksgiving mm -hmm. until we hear Alice's restaurant. Absolutely. And then immediately after that, we hear, what's the song from Waitresses You Like? Oh, Christmas Wrappings. Christmas Wrappings. Then we can start playing Christmas Then music. Then I shall allow it, being the nice Jewish girl that I am. There you go. <laughs> very generous of you. So tell us something we probably didn't know about Stan Lee. <laughs> so this was this was a cute little thing that just kind of popped up. So, you know, obviously we we talked about it, you know, just uh, last week or the week before about, you know, some things popping up. Uh, it's been two years now that that Stan had had. You know, Stan Lee had passed away. Um, so the late, greatly missed Stan Lee was known for his creativity, his kindness, and his incredible moral compass. He's also known for speaking his mind. Uh, so it seems that Lee's former sound engineer, uh, Aaron Fromm, had captured a, the very essence of Lee in a recording that showcases the Marvel legend going off on a very hilarious and profane rant that had everybody in the studio laughing. So Fromm actually collaborated with an artist to animate this oddly heartwarming glimpse into the man's great mind calling it sessions with stan it's a very quick one minute and 38 animated video that is very not safe for work so don't have the kids listen to it unless they're older uh and don't listen to it if you actually are going into work if you're working from home then that's different um but it's definitely worth a listen if you are a fan of stanley and the animation is is a is adorable because you can totally see stan doing that in you know knowing his mannerisms when you hear him talk and 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 would see him perform and again, it's a cute little, you know, he just kind of goes off on a little tangent and it's it's a nice little thing that you wouldn't expect to hear from him, but done in classic Stan. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Uh, we'll be right back with our insightful picks. Go for your insightful pick and so, for dancing the music that's not there. Do, 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 So my insightful pick um, was one that we had watched as a family last. Thief. You're a thief. What? You didn't write it down? I did. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> anyway, it is the Lego Star Wars holiday special uh, that premiered on Disney Plus on Life Day uh, last week. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it's a much better version of the 
Star Wars holiday special than the original. Sacrilege. That came out. Um, it, it's just a cute, you know, it's not anything like the Legos uh, movies that have come out. Uh, Lego Batman or, or the Lego movie. It's, it's done more. If you've ever watched the different Star Wars Lego uh, shows that have come out it's done you know along those those lines uh, some of the same voices but then we also had uh, for a lot of the current characters the actual actors did uh, those voices uh, in in this episode um, so the Legos holiday uh, special is a playful and joyous celebration of this of the Skywalker saga set after the events of episode nine, featuring a cross timeline mashup of iconic heroes and villains all set against the trappings and holidays and spirits of the holidays. So the story opens with the festive holiday of life day. Everybody across the galaxy is in a festive spirit, but Ray is just so focused on embarking on a mission and BB eight joins her to go to the Jedi Temple to kind of find more meaning to things. And when she does that, this whole adventure begins where basically every character <laughs> throughout Star Wars makes some sort of an appearance in this. Um, and and I think that kind of added to the fun of it because you know this would never happen in any Star Wars movie, but you could do it in, in Star Wars Lego. It was kind of a Doctor Who-ish thing where you had, you know, all three versions of some of the same characters uh, together in, in one scene, which was just kind of, it was cute. It was, you know, tongue-in-cheek. There were little, you know, um, you know, uh, Easter eggs for, for the parents and, and, you know, jokes for them and plenty of jokes, you know, for the kids with a nice happy ending, you know, at the end. So it, it did leave us with uh, a new eternal question of Star Wars of which hand shot first. Right. <laughs> so good pick. Good pick. Thank you. So my pick this week is uh, not Star Wars holiday special. Uh, it and could. I, I'm not at all bitter about that. Just for the record. <sighs> Uh, Just my, wanted to go on record with that, right? My pick this week uh, is actually a documentary called Warrior's Way on Amazon Prime. The ancient warriors often described as both gallant and heroic. But what was life truly like for history's martial men? The series traces the lives of famous warriors from childhood training to bloody battle. Each episode focuses on legendary warlike cultures known for their achievements on the battlefield, their knowledge of military strategy, and innovative engineering weapons and armor. Uh, the interesting thing about this is they take from very different uh, time periods. Uh, you take a look at the Vikings, you look at Knights Templars, you look at Celtic warriors, uh, you look at Roman warriors, Scottish clansmen, and you look even at uh, Mongolian warriors as well. And the interesting take on this is that they don't just look at the history of them. Uh, you actually look at specific individuals that are recorded through history and what their lives look like. So there was kind of a an overall high arcing uh, view of what a Roman warrior is and, and some of the accomplishments of Julius Caesar, but you look at this one particular legionnaire uh, who happened to come from one of the barbarian tribes and his father became a Roman citizen and a lot of background information that you wouldn't normally see on a documentary like this. So a very interesting, very different take on the uh, military uh, um, documentary style. Uh, Warrior's Way on Amazon Prime. Uh, 
Thank you. I appreciate that. No problem. I'm here for you. Um, so I think that was it. Despite all of the technical issues we had this week, um, I apologize to those who are listening live this week. I'm going to try and get all that cleaned up in post. It's okay. So uh, we, we should look a little bit more professional eh. uh, on Monday morning when it goes live. Where's the fun of that? Uh, I would invite folks to check out our long-form articles on Medium, which uh, they're classics at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't Go read those classics. That's, you know, yeah. when Edison <laughs> invented the well, light bulb. Melville, uh, Insights into <laughs> Things. We're right up there at this point. <laughs> That's um, nice. I like that. We do uh, go live on Mondays. Our video versions you can find as Insights into Things. Our audio is Insights into Entertainment on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon, and Pandora. Uh, you can contact us via email at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We stream six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. On Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. Once in a while, hopefully a little more frequently than we do our medium posts, we'll actually put something on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things. The audio version of all of our pa podcasts are at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. You can get high res versions of our our videos on youtube.com slash insights into things and finally everything and anything that we've mentioned can be found on our master website uh at www.insightsintothings.com all right uh, i did want to put a little teaser out there that we do have our holiday special we are currently in post-production mm -hmm. on we did the recording for it uh, I am trying to desperately find material that I can use to make a video because, you know, it's always better when you can watch pictures slowly move on the screen while you're listening to the audio. Right, right. Uh, so hopefully we'll have that for you maybe next week. Uh, that's what I'm shooting for. Oh, okay. Um, since I have to do so much post work on this one, I probably won't finish it this weekend. <laughs> that's okay. Not that I'm bitter about that either. No, not at all. Just saying. Just saying. Uh, so that's all we had this week. Mm -hmm. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. And we're out real quietly. <laughs>